For several years we dreamed of getting into the Chernobyl exclusion zone, and now, our deeds allowed us to get out of Lugansk to Pripyat. This long-awaited day has arrived. So, here we are at the entrance to the city of Pripyat. The radiation here is quite high. Yes, especially there. It's the northern trail. The dosimeter there was just dying, winking at us. Here it is advisable not to go especially along the roadsides, because... They won't let you back. As soon as we arrived at the goal, in the exclusion zone, we did not even know where we should go, to the Ark or to the observation deck of the fourth block, and we started our journey from the ghost town of Pripyat. We are starting. Here, it really feels different. No matter how many documentaries I have watched, they do not convey the atmosphere that reigns here. Walking through the streets of Pripyat, one gets the feeling that someone still lives here and hides from me. But we haven't seen anyone yet. Of course, it's hard to believe, but it's kind of like the city center. Not really. Our center is Sportivnaya Street. Now I will show you how it looked. We found a large radioactive background in the park, near the Ferris wheel, which was planned to be launched on May 1, 1986. As far as I know, it was here that helicopters landed, which dumped bromine containing sand into the reactor. There are many legends about this amusement park. The most common one is that this wheel has not made a single turn, a symbol of unfulfilled childhood hopes. And the second version is that this wheel worked on the 26th and 27th of April, in order to prevent a panic mood. This is just a lie, in fact, the park was launched twice, these were test runs, when people could ride on the attractions, the autodrome, the wheel. Then we went to the famous ladle, from which strong radiation emanates. Because of this, school children love to climb there. We were a little concerned that we have one dosimeter for two Bella, and it has a large error. But it is able to show us a high background. And it was reassuring. So far nothing has been heard. And how did it get here? Here was the robotics workshop. Post-accident. And what is it for? What it is intended for. History is silent. Already there is some feeling. Yes, it squeaks a lot. Yes, it is interesting to visit the Death Bucket, one of the most famous sites of Pripyat. We're taking in too much, right? Into yourself. <laughs> then we went to the third school. At the entrance to the school, we felt the frozen spirit of the Soviet Union, posters, toys, inventory, all things of that era. And we see how nature slowly but surely takes its toll. These are steps, a tree has grown on them. Finally, we came to the Azure Pool, which worked until 1997, while the station was in operation. Employees of the Enterprises of Pripyat came here for a swim after a working day. At that time, all communications in the city were in good condition. There was hot water, electricity, the pool could work. But what it has become now is very sad. The gym is rotten, broken windows due to aluminum frames, the paint is peeling off everywhere, the tiles are falling off. I will show you. It was here that I swam, like all other people. Here we had compulsory swimming lessons. Every Thursday, at least in my class, the first two lessons were held here. Serious pool and depth is good. Now we will visit the observation deck of the 4th power unit. 
and also look at the unfinished 5th and 6th power units, and show how you can lure a 120-inch catfish to the surface. Let's go! The first thing I would like to say is that the territory of the station itself is huge. Even from afar, I was surprised at how gigantic the sarcophagus was being built. But on the other hand, this explains why the construction takes so long. The construction of 30,000 tons of steel looks very impressive. From a distance, a person looks smaller than an ant against this background. But at the entrance to the observation deck, we were haunted by the radiation background, from which the dosimeter burst. We are at the famous observation deck. As they explained to us, the object is carefully guarded, supposedly everything cannot be filmed in a row. But they didn't tell us that it was forbidden to shoot, so we filmed everything. It looks, of course, very large scale, there is nothing to say. The background here wasn't that big, only 300 units, but the source wasn't the soil, but the shelter itself. A distance of almost 1,000 feet saves us, therefore, the walls of the shelter emit radiation quite strongly, approximately 1,400 units and above. And why is it so strong? The shelter can't cope. Shelters have never been airtight, hence so strong. But let's not stop here. Let's go look at the giant catfish. Oh, there are a lot of them. Will they sail away? Vice versa. They think that there are people here, and swim up. It is a pity that there is no bread, but I would have to throw a whole loaf. Oh, we forgot to take the bread, it's a pity. They know that they are fed here. They were fed here even before the accident. And by the way, I forgot to tell two unusual features. The first, is that catfish, as a rule, live in depressions on the bottom and feed on carrion, but here, in order for them to surface, you just need to tap your foot on the bridge. And the second feature, the fact is that this fish grows throughout its life. Well, let's look at future impracticable projects. Fifth and sixth blocks. It was for them that these cooling towers were built. When approaching, we found just a giant garbage dump, something from refrigerators, something from other units. But none of these things radiate. We hadn't even left, when all of a sudden... Somewhere something strongly radiates. For several minutes, we ran in search of a source. And just like that, we found it. Somewhere in this place lies something radioactive. Perhaps some kind of pebble, buried somewhere about half a meter. If it had not been buried, it would have radiated much more strongly. Of course, one does not want to think that there is a radioactive repository near the cooling tower. The cooling tower itself is huge. You can feel the construction on a grand scale, in the style of the Soviet Union. There is a lot of space here, at least you can fly on balloons. And now let's go to the cooling pond where the fish was raised before the accident. Judging by the remains, there were large fish here. There is a severe drought this year, and what used to be under the cover of water can be easily seen. And here is the place where the fry are raised. Looks cool! Wow! test tubes. In these things they grew up. Fry were obtained from caviar. They were grown to a certain size and released. Well, we finally got to a unique technical facility that is so inexplicably drawn to itself. This is an arc. The complex got its name arc due to the fact that it seems to look beyond the horizon. The sand is like the sea. And the Russian woodpecker has long been nicknamed by foreigners for this sound. Since it worked at frequencies from 3 to 18 megahertz, and in some countries intersected with their civilian frequencies. To be precise, the arch over the horizon radar station is designed for early detection of launches of intercontinental ballistic missiles, its range is up to 6,000 miles. Not far from the checkpoint, firewood is lying around, I wonder if it is for heating or for further export. As soon as we started to approach, we heard some strange sound. It is somewhat similar to the sound when a ship is deformed during a storm. But no. As we were explained, this is the so-called arc singing. That is, when the wind penetrates the partitions, such a sound is obtained. 
What is that creaking sound? It is so voluminous that you can't even understand where it comes from. Judging by the height, I can only guess what kind of foundation is under it. The one who saw it will not be able to convey these scales. See those ditches? These are large drops that wash out the sand under the antenna. When we walked under the antenna, we thought that we would not even reach half. It is just huge, and walking on the sand is not so easy. According to approximate data, its length is from 1,000 to 1,600 feet, and the height is in the range of 440 to 500 feet, and weight 26,000 tons. Next to it is a slightly smaller antenna for a higher frequency. We were also told that roofer stalkers get to the top in about 1.5 hours, but they have climbed similar objects before. This is the same climb for stalkers, where they climb, right? The most interesting thing is that only officers could use this elevator when it was built and tested. And the soldiers had to crawl up the stairs. Most likely, yes, so as not to relax. Let's not ride the elevator. Now let's see what kind of elevator was here and what its carrying capacity is. Here, the start of the elevator. For two people. Only two officers probably got in. There is a sixth point here. Even heating. If I'm not mistaken, according to the worm gear, the elevator did not rise like in ordinary entrances. Sasha, there are a lot of them. This is lift number three. The mechanism was interesting. Here, these are the rollers themselves, which they held, and so it rose. Everything is very, very, very interesting. But unfortunately, we are quite limited in time. Passing here, we saw just an unimaginable number of tracks. That is, people regularly walk here, and there is an impression that they just trampled here, for the sake of good photographs, for the sake of material, there is sand here. It's just that the antenna itself is perfectly visible from this side. Only three such complexes were built. One in Nikolaev, an experimental one, and two more full-fledged ones, in the Chernigov region and in the Far East, in Komsomolsky on Amor. This complex is located here for a reason. The reason for this was that these antennas absorbed a huge amount of electricity, and here there is a nuclear power plant, which could fully supply electricity, just nearby. But to date, only one antenna of this kind has been preserved. The rest had previously been dismantled for recycling. But this antenna was never able to work fully and it was never put on full combat duty. By the beginning of 1986, it had been slightly modernized. Tests were scheduled for November, but an accident that occurred in April thwarted all plans. Since the ventilation and cooling system sucked in radioactive air, all the equipment was taken to Komsomolsk on Amur. After some time, new ways of detecting missiles were found, the radar station was outdated. But you are probably wondering why no one has so far cut this antenna into scrap metal? And the reason is very simple. It is strictly forbidden to demolish the antenna by demolition, since during an explosion and when it falls, it raises a huge amount of radionuclides into the air, and hiring climbers to dismantle it is unprofitable. Even though someone is constantly stealing and taking something out, we found something to look at on the territory of the radar system. Sometimes there are mountains of equipment. Communication centers with their length are somewhat reminiscent of the subway. Yes, just look at the length. There is a corridor of such magnitude that you can even arrange races. Everything is cut down. What for? To make it easier to throw out. Throw out? I don't know, but I think so. Thinking out loud. Is there something blocked here too? It looks like it. There are fire boxes about every 100 meters. And sometimes we meet hatches. It turns out that there was a cable collector right below us, and judging by the cable brackets, there was just an incredible amount. This is probably a techie's paradise. For us, yes. It's all, it's radio cards. Do you want a photo? There is a total of one and a half gigabytes of memory. Yes, very little.
Of course, you can walk for a long time, but Chernobyl itself is waiting for us, there are a lot of interesting things there, unlike Pripyat and other radar facilities, it's not that much of a mess. We will talk and hear stories from an eyewitness of the events, Alexander Sirota, which took place in April 1986. He, like no one else, will be able to convey what the situation was in the city when the accident occurred. And why did you run exactly to the medical unit? Something out of the ordinary was happening. It never happened. Yes, this has never happened before. When I went to school, I already noticed some oddity. Irrigation trucks drove around the city. I don't know, about 20 to 30 ambulances. Is this the same medical unit? Yes. And then there was a group of people. And on stretchers they brought people into the core. So let's go. At first, we were interested in how things are now in the Shea and how the situation is controlled. In all former settlements we will see booths. There are special, special systems. They monitor around the clock. Around the clock? Do they monitor gamma? Not only that, they also monitor the gamma background. There is a gamma sensor and there is also a system that, roughly speaking, collects air into itself like a vacuum cleaner. Dust is deposited on the filters. They are removed and constantly monitored in the laboratory. Does the special service usually come? Of course. This network covers the entire exclusion zone. Data from it is publicly available on the website. We can even check ourselves. Yes, we will also go. There is a scoreboard on the post office building. There was a fire here recently. Was the background crazy? In fact, no, fires occur in the exclusion zone. Over the entire existence of the zone, this has ceased to be something extraordinary. Not critical. Yes, just like outside the zone. Wherever there are forests, there are forest and step fires. Then we went to the ARC radar station to the communication center. Alexander told how Opamni walks in places with radiation. They defiantly eat apples and stuff. They did not go through what we went through. They do not know what the death of loved ones from diseases that suddenly came from nowhere is. And so on. And they are now encouraging other young people to do stupid things. And it's very annoying. And I understand that I can't influence this. If a person is young, then I won't be able to put it into his head if he hasn't lived it. They know that people have died here. For example, we talked about the basement with the firemen. This is the clothes of people who died in a short time from very high radiation panels. They know it's very radioactive there. This is one of the dirtiest and most dangerous places available today. It is more dangerous only inside the object itself. And they climb there, without protection, even without some kind of primitive. The main criterion for measuring the radioactive background for them now is a comparison with a transatlantic flight. But in fact, any sane person understands that it is impossible to come up with a more delusional comparison. Being at the epicenter of events, where radionuclides lie, almost all of which were, in fact, in the fuel and they simultaneously inhale it all and say that it is as safe as flying in an airplane. But not everything is so bad. Alexander also said that there are other, illegal visitors to the zone, who are gradually restoring some objects. There are those who come to Pripyat and restore inscriptions, all sorts of old ones. For example, the famous inscription, let the atom be a worker, not a soldier, on the building. This inscription was dismantled in 1986. But the boys came and restored it overnight. They picked it up from the street. There are huge letters, fixed them on the building, and now there is this inscription. Now let's fast forward to the events that took place on April 26, 1986, in the morning. Something was smoking a little, but, in general, it was not very interesting for us, because at that time planes began to fly into the city, and it was much more interesting. That is, a huge helicopter, a military one, is also dragging something on a cable. And then we immediately ran in that direction from the bridge where we saw helicopters landing. And they sat down. Well, this is what we saw, near the river port. And we again ran from the overpass. This way, past the hospital. People were still walking. We ran to the pier. When we arrived, 
the helicopter was gone, and along the way, we remembered that we had an extracurricular task. For the May holidays we needed to make a gift to our mother, a kind of handmade. It was necessary to take a jar. No matter what size, find clay, coat this jar with clay, stick dry peas or beans in it, and make it look like a vase. And we decided, since we are already here, let's go and collect clay. Well, so we did, smeared like hell in this clay. Then I went home when it was time for the end of the lesson. I came home, all dirty, in clay. Of course I didn't tell my mother that I skipped classes. I made a gift to her. You can't do that, otherwise the surprise would be ruined. Therefore, on the go, a version was invented that we had a community work day at school. And by this time, my mother was already aware that something quite serious had happened at the station, and that it was not recommended to go out into the street and let the children out. And she was very indignant why in one school the children were not allowed to go outside, but in ours they decided to arrange a cleanup day. She locked me up and went to investigate. Were you very worried when you realized that their information would not converge? For three to four minutes I was very worried, and then they threw a pebble out the window. You saw, I lived on the second floor. I went there, one of my friends was walking there, and we started Facebook, like I'm in the window, and they're on the street. And in general, I quickly forgot about what happened there. And then helicopters began to fly over us again. The boys ran to watch, and I was wildly jealous. But as I understand it, my mother didn't get there, because she probably heard something, met someone, and went to the Palace of Culture trying to get through to the station to find out what happened there. Was there any information? No information was given. That is, the information came only from people who were there and saw something. But no one could assess the scale, even those who were supposed to. Just because such accidents never happened, and people were taught, by specialists, that an accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is practically impossible, especially a radiation one, it is in principle excluded. About an hour later, there was a knock on our door. The representative of the housing and communal services said, well, he knocked on all neighboring rooms at the same time, and very briefly said that we had to prepare for a temporary evacuation. There was a fire at the station, we needed to take essential things, and we would be taken out for three days to a tent camp near Pripyat, just in case, like a security measure. The situation is under control, that nothing terrible has happened. This is done just in case as part of civil defense exercises. More or less like this. Look, another important moment, it was around 4 to 5 o'clock, on April 26. That is, he says, prepare for evacuation. What are you doing? You take what you need and go to the entrance. Passport, documents, some things. Of course, all the residents of our entrance gathered there, discussing among themselves what happened at the station. Right there, children played in the sandbox. Helicopters flew right there. I asked my mother for leave, and my friends and I went to the stadium, nearby. After a while, my mother catches up with me, returns me, scolds that I ran far away, and we are for an hour and a half near the entrance, on the street. For understanding, the evacuation began only at 2 o'clock the next day. The accident happened on the night of the 25th to the 26th, and the evacuation on the 27th at 2 p.m. The readiness for evacuation is almost 100%. In terms of transport, for all the necessary manipulations, it was already ready somewhere by 9 o'clock in the evening. They only waited for the command. The command did not arrive. That is, the people who came, their task was, ideally, to come and say, close the windows, close the doors, cover all kinds of cracks with damp rags and sit and wait for further orders. The bus would pull up and you would get off. Yes, it would greatly reduce the dose that people receive. And in general, many suffered from radiation? Did you get hurt somehow? Of course. But we will not talk about this. There is a book, Pripyat Syndrome, written by my mother, Lubav Sirota. Everything is detailed there, and... I'm telling you how I, the child, saw it, and there it is told how my mother saw it. And it turned out that from later information it turned out that not only were they not going to evacuate the city, but they also misinformed, including the government, that everything was normal and under control.
Already April 26. Here is a document, relatively recently declassified, April 26, 1986 from the first Deputy Minister of Energy and Electrification. And there are major key points here. On April 26, at 1.21 a.m., when Unit 4 of the Chernobyl NPP was put into scheduled repair, after the reactor was shut down, an explosion occurred in the upper part of the reactor compartment. According to the third main department under the USSR Ministry of Health, no special measures, including the evacuation of the population from the city, are required. You just need to understand that the location of the city is a violation of all norms, too close to the station. You most likely do not remember this. Almost a year before 98 to 99, Pripyat was rarely mentioned at all. They did not write about this in any official document. Everywhere they said, Chernobyl, it happened in Chernobyl. Chernobyl is 10 miles from the station. It has 14,000 inhabitants. Pripyat is 1.5 miles and 50,000 people. That is, it was very easy to give apartments somewhere on Sakhalin, as far as possible from here. It's on that side. There, right? Cranes are visible, over there on the horizon. And what's that? There, the cargo port, they are still standing. There's a yacht club, and so on. Here are the photos. This is a view of the other side before the accident. This is a reclaimed sandy massif for the 6th micro district. It is currently one of the largest burial grounds in the city. The so-called point of temporary localization of radioactive waste, Sandy Plateau. Furniture. Refrigerators from those apartments are buried there. But as it turned out later, the evacuation did not solve all the problems. People were drawn to their hometown. And in Pripyat, despite the fact that everything is abandoned, I can come to my apartment, I can come to the place where I spent the best part of my childhood. The entrance is blocked, you see? In a certain sense, it even gives some advantages over people who have nowhere to return to. Although, of course, it is also sad to see how the city is being destroyed before our eyes, but, built in the 70s, 16 years in operation, 30 years without operation, without running water, without heating. This is essentially the future of all buildings in the city, brick earlier, panel later. Here is the entrance to my classroom, here on the first floor. In conclusion, we fished a little. Biting? Oh, something is moving. First fish today. Somewhere around 7 minutes we waited for it. Such a fish, small of course. We won't cook it. So, well, come here. Fish, don't eat our camera. The fish wants to eat. It seems to me that in my hands it already did not want to eat. Well, fish. You jump on your own. Come on, gas it up. Chernobyl. From this city, many goosebumps run down the skin. And someone has a burning desire to go there. It earned this wild popularity thanks to the worst man-made accident in the history of mankind. In general, we just went into the store, before we came here, to drink coffee, and immediately a law enforcement officer approached us and asked to be witnesses. I'm starting to enjoy this trip more and more. We are now at the Chernobyl bus station, we are going to drink coffee. After a little search, we went to a proven place, this is the 10 Cafe. Here we took coffee and finally began to explore the city. It's really expensive, 14 hryvnia. In fact, the name Chernobyl underplayed the scale of the accident, because the city of Pripyat, which is located a little more than one mile away, with a population of just under 50,000 inhabitants, was more affected. Against Chernobyl, which was 11 miles away with a population of about 13,000. Significant difference, isn't it? Chernobyl did not suffer much from the accident, so it was decided not to close it. We can say that it is, as it were, half abandoned. Figuratively speaking, this is the capital of the exclusion zone. Here are the best conditions. There are shops, a post office, a canteen, a shuttle bus to Kiev. You can go to the children if they live in Kiev. 
Let's get back to our food for a bit. For example, in Chernobyl there is a canteen and a cafe where we took coffee. Let's take a look there and see. It is interesting that there is such an institution in Chernobyl. Prices are inexpensive, as in the most ordinary cafe in Kiev, and in the same building there is a hotel where you can also spend the night after dinner. On the streets you can meet some passers-by, it can be both employees of some structures and just local residents, the so-called self-settlers. They are treated with condescension, despite the order, which prohibits the movement of a two-wheeled vehicle. There are almost no young people here, only workers. Where do you think you can work? In fact, there are plenty of places. Even more than that, the most important places are the nuclear power plant, the construction of the sarcophagus. It needs a lot of maintenance staff and simple institutions that can be found in any other city. These are mail, communication, trade, and so on. This city is like a museum. Everywhere there are monuments, exhibitions of equipment that participated in the collection of radioactive waste. But this apparatus, as we were told, stands without a wheel for a reason, it could not be cleaned of radioactive dust, and therefore it was simply removed. As Alexander told us, this monument was created and installed on the initiative of firefighters, at the expense of this fire department. As I understand it, this part of the monument helps to understand how bad the firefighter was. They did not yet know how dangerous radiation was and how to protect themselves from it. Until one after the other, they didn't get sick. But if they thought only of themselves, then the scale of the accident could be many times greater. The fire could spread to the third power unit, and it would have had much more terrible consequences. This alley helps to understand the magnitude of the disaster. These are all settlements that were located in the Shea zone, and those that are marked in black. They are no longer there. Driving along some streets, you might think that you are driving in a forest or in some kind of park, but if you look closely, you will see that it was once a street with houses, institutions, for example, there was a military registration and enlistment office. But what about radiation, you ask? Here people live, work, tours are held. Well, firstly, there are constantly scanning sensors on the territory, which will notify the staff if the radiation rises. And secondly, the general background in Chernobyl is no higher than in Kiev. We even relaxed and almost did not take measures measurements here, only in some places we tried to identify the source, but to no avail. On this trip, we were greatly disappointed by our ancient dosimeter. Of course, it is able to show a strong source, but its slowness, waiting 30 seconds while it measures, increased the risk of getting into something radioactive. Better follow my footsteps. Does it go over the top? Get out the same way you came in. Same way. Poorly cleaned, huh? Or are they just not clean? We prepared for the next trip in advance. We chose in Quilly this dosimeter. Why did we choose this one? I'll tell you now. Inside our dosimeter is a powerful processor that instantly detects danger. A beta-1 sensor is installed, sensitive to beta and gamma radiation. The color display refreshes quickly and changes color from green to yellow and from yellow to red, depending on the level of radiation. Also, the red LED starts blinking and the speaker squeaks disgustingly, which will force you to leave the radioactive place. On the back wall, there is a battery compartment and a cover with a lead plate. If you remove it or turn it over, then in this mode it will show gamma plus beta. At the top is a USB connector for data transfer to a PC and for recharging. I also like the search mode. Although the speed is low, but the reaction is just instantaneous, especially when compared with our Bell dosimeter. In general, the thing is really cool, I'm already looking forward to when we go to the Shea and really experience it.